Okay, welcome everybody. You see my light go off? There's a ghost in there. Hey, welcome everybody to our AP English language webinar. We're gonna give everybody one more minute to join and we'll get started. Okay, maybe just a couple more seconds. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob O'Sullivan. I'm the Associate Publisher of Test Prep at McGraw-Hill. And I wanna welcome you to our Five Steps to a Five AP Language AP English Language and Composition webinar. This is our fifth of eight webinars. Uh, we're happy to have you join us. Uh, the, the goal of this session is to give you, we're about six weeks out from the exam, so we're gonna uh, have the author of our book and the expert on the English language test share with you all the most important things you should be doing between now and test day, so welcome. Before we begin, I'd just like to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping items. You can see that, that you can see my screen, yes, Barbara? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, just a quick note up top, although we know we have teachers and students on the line, this is part, this is specifically geared towards students. This is a student review. Um, so if your student's on the line, feel free to share it with other students. Uh, teachers, feel free to share this with your students. We would love you to ask questions throughout the session. If you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A feature. If you could quickly type your question into that Q&A section, that's where we'll be getting them. Um, the chat will also be active. We wrote on this slide that we weren't going to be monitoring it. And guess what? Uh, in the ones that we've done so far, we do wind up monitoring it. It actually has been pretty helpful when people have questions. Uh, but we would urge you to the real questions, content related questions you have, please um, limit those to the Q&A button. If you get in there and you see someone else has already asked your question, hit the thumbs up. That's an upvote. We're going to know that's an important question to address. Uh, you guys won't be able to see each other. The, pa the participants on the call will not be able to see or hear each other. You should be able to see both me and the host, Barbara. Um, but other than that, just you'll just communicate uh, in writing. An important note for people, for teachers on the line, uh, we want to reiterate that no student data is being collected for this thing. No student email addresses, no student names or numbers. Uh, I know that was a big thing um, that people were concerned about, so just be assured that we're good with that. The presentation is interactive. We're gonna have polling as we go through. So please do participate, even if you're not sure of the answer. Uh, it makes it more fun and more interactive when everybody gets involved. So as we go through, when you see a poll, answer it. Um, it's, uh, it makes it a better for all of us. And a last note is that this session is actually being recorded and the recording as of tomorrow, uh, once we're finished, will live here. If you wanna quickly take a photo of that, bit.ly, that URL with your phone. I'll give it a couple seconds. Uh, that's where it will be living. Uh, teachers, feel free to go in, share it with other teachers. Uh, students, share it with other students. That's where it's going to be. And the agenda. We're going to do a quick uh, introduction for Barbara Murphy. 
English AP English language rock star. She's going to share with you uh, some of the reader notes and her experience as being a College Board reader um, and what she looks for and what she knows that the College Board readers are looking for as they're grading the exams over the summer. We're going to run through some essential topics that uh, we think are important to review. We're going to get into a couple of multiple, a uh, few multiple, more than a few multiple choice questions and some pre response prompts. I'm going to do a quick five minutes at the end on a bench prep course summary. That's basically our digital piece. I want to make sure that you guys all know how to use it and see what's in there, uh, that you can use that to study over the next five or six weeks. And at the end, we'll hit any questions that we haven't addressed throughout. With that, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Barbara Murphy. Uh, Barbara, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm so pleased that you're able to join us uh, for this AP English Language Review Seminar. Uh, I'm an old dame with this subject uh, as an instructor, as an AP reader, and as an author. And what I'm hoping we can do today is to play on two things. And, be, uh, and in order to start that play, I'd like you to take a, a piece of paper, a pen or pencil, whatever, and quickly respond to this particular brief question. Just a one word response, that's all I'm asking for, okay? So in one single word, what describes how you feel right now about your being prepared to take the English language exam on May 10th? Just one word, okay, one word. You can pop that in the chat. No, 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 it's just, it's just private. It's they don't need to, okay, we don't wanna share it. All right, this, gotcha. This is private. This is, you know, know thyself. And um, with that in mind, um, we're going to kind of play on this um, old uh, motto. The scout's motto is be prepared. And also in that context, uh, there's an old joke, excuse the joke. It's uh, one man says to another, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the response is practice, practice. So today, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be kind of like looking at this webinar as a scout's guide uh, to your finding your way to the Carnegie Hall of AP English language. Excuse that metaphor, it's, it's so extended, but go with it for a while. So if we can go to the next slides, what I'm going to try to do for you today is to give you some, some tips, some pointers, some uh, answer some questions that you may have with regard to the exam in the course in general. And uh, we will proceed now, if we can take the next slide, Bob. Most of you already know this, but there are some that may want to have a review, a quick review. The basic text information is this, it's three hours and 15 minutes long. That first hour is made up of multiple choice questions for one hour. 45 questions, which we will talk about as we go through the presentation. You get a break, yay for you. Then you come back. And for two hours and 15 minutes, you write three different essays. One of those essays will be rhetorical analysis, the other argument, the other synthesis. They're gonna be graded, rate, uh, uh, wrong word. And we'll talk about that word. They're not graded, they're scored according to a rubric, which goes from one to six, one being the lowest, six being the highest. And you will have to recognize that the multiple choice section of the exam is worth 45% of the grade. And the frequently, um, the uh, free response questions are worth 55% of the final scoring. So at this particular point, you are so lucky, you're gonna be able to take this exam in person this year. It's kind of like back to normal. Uh, there are gonna be very, very few digital situations at this point. So most of you will be in a large room taking this exam um, person to person. Okay, Bob? I'm gonna go over something very quickly. I'm hoping that as this year progressed, you've had a chance to talk to people who have taken this course, who have taught this course. You're gonna be talking to people about how you wanna to plan to prepare yourself now for that exam. And in the elite, and in the regular edition of Five Steps to a Five AP English Language, we give you some of those forms that you can take to prep for the exam. And if you have a chance, take a look at those and make a commitment 
to try one of those plans that'll get you right up to that day when you're walking into the room and taking that exam. So if you get a chance, take a look at that. Next, Bob. Ah, here we are. We are 41 days away from that exam. Okay. Here's what I'd like you to do. When you get the chance, retake that diagnostic exam that you find in, a, in the five steps book. Evaluate your strengths and your weaknesses. Be honest with yourself, okay? You're the only one who knows. Study the appropriate chapters and activities in the five-step book and go over those rapid review sections that are at the ends of each chapter, okay? Practice creating multiple choice questions of different types if you have a study group. And if your instructor is giving you practice, don't go, ha, 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 I can do this. Go with it. Give it your best concentration. Once you have a chance, then complete practice exam one and develop those review workshops for your study guides and for your study group. This is absolutely necessary. And as a reminder, you'll find out more about this at the end don't forget about the cross-platform that's available to you throughout the year. It is incredibly valuable. You just got to get used to it. Remember, it'll be new to you, but give it a chance. You have so many activities, so many ways of reviewing your skills that you should not pass it by. Okay, Bob, two weeks before the exam, you've taken the diagnostic. You've taken the first exam. Now let's take a look. Highlight, go to the glossary. Okay, in the five step book, take a look at the vocab there and ask yourself, is there anything I'm not familiar with? And if there is something you're unfamiliar with, promise yourself you'll do a quick review. And if you don't know the answer or can't find it right away, ask your instructor or ask one of your study mates. Okay, promise yourself that. Write at least three timed situations and take three timed multiple choice situations during those last two weeks. Here's the reason. The more practice you have, the more comfortable you're going to be, the less tense you'll be. And the only way you can get prepared is to put yourself in a timed situation. This is the game, folks. It's a game you're almost playing. It is a timed situation, okay? You're going for the goal. What is it that you need to do to make that goal. So take that practice exam two in the five-step book. Again, score yourself. And if you get a chance, work with your study groups. Remember, you are ready for this. You just have to go back over, see what you need to take a look at again before you walk into that room on May 10th. Courage and persevere, folks. Bob? That was a, the night before the exam, Promise yourself you're going to eat a good dinner. Okay, something you really like. Give yourself a chance to relax. Watch a movie. Call your friends. Play a computer game. Look at Instagram. But the thing to do is to congratulate yourself. You're there. Okay, you've done this. You've gone through this course. You are ready to show the world that you can do this and do it well. Get a good night's sleep. And in the morning, don't forget eat a really good breakfast, okay? Don't walk out the door without it, okay? So let's take a look at uh, the major sections of the exam. The first one we'll go through is the multiple choice section. Folks, I wanna tell you something. The multiple choice section is formally based on rhetorical analysis and writing. Okay, the writing section, which we will talk about, is kind of new for the past two years. And this is where most people seem to be, you know, a little bit nervous. They don't know what to expect from it. We're going to take a look at it. And uh, if you would, please, the next one. And okay. now here are the frequently asked questions. Let me go through these. Okay, most of you will say, ah, you know, Merck, I've taken so many multiple choice questions. I know, ah, not so fast. Back away a little bit and take a close look at what AP demands of you in a multiple choice question. The first thing to remember is that it is 45% of your final score, okay? And it's based solely on the number of questions you get correct. There is no magic formula. 
There is no, you know, crazy algorithm. It's just a straight number of correct out of 45 questions. Now, those 45 questions will be comprised of five different readings. Okay. Two of those readings will be related to reading comprehension and rhetorical analysis. Okay. There are going to be um, 23, 25 questions, and those readings will come from many different areas, many different time periods, uh, but you will be required to read two of those. That's the first section. The second section of the multiple choice is the writing section. And that will consist of three different readings. Okay, And you will be asked to take a close look and to make some decisions at a, as a writer. Okay, What would you do to delete some additional material or to add some material to make a transition, to change positions. This is the editing and the revision process. I think for most people, it's go that's going to be the longer of the two sections. So if we can take a look at question two. Bob, there we go. We have, what are the major categories of the multiple choice question? We just said there, that there are both types of readings and writing, but they will always concern themselves with the rhetorical situation or the reader's reading's claim and the support given for that claim, the line of reasoning, which is the organization, and the writing style. So no matter what reading you have in front of you, this is going to be the central focus for the uh, creation of those questions. Next. The expectations of the reading questions, okay? Watch this. They're going to expect you to clarify how choices are related to the rhetorical situation. They're gonna ask you to analyze claims and evidence as they are related to the thesis. They're also gonna ask you to analyze the line of reasoning presented in the argument. And they're gonna ask you to infer or conclude how stylistic elements relate to the text's purpose or intent. Question I've always asked is, will they ever mix the reading and the writing questions for the same text, okay? No. If it's a reading question, those are the questions. If it's a writing, those are the writing questions. They're not gonna be mixed together. You don't have to worry about that. Now, the expectations of the writing question. This, I think, for most of you is going to take you longer to do because here's what you have to do. You have to demonstrate your ability to make choices in the text in response to the rhetorical situation. You have to choose relevant evidence in developing a line of reasoning. You may have to evaluate the organization in commentary when trying to strengthen the line of reasoning or you may have to decide which words and or composition elements have to be used or be deleted to strengthen the presentation of the argument. Okay. So the next question. Did I flip it? I thought that, yep. There we go. There we go. Um, the general strategies, ah, here we go. Everybody wants to know, how do you do, how do you do well on the multiple choice questions? Number one, Make certain you read carefully, okay? Don't, I, what I have found personally that when I make mistakes with multiple choice, I skip things. I try to skim things. Tell yourself, slow down, read it carefully and read as if you're reading aloud to an audience. Read all the information provided in the text. Read closely, underline, circle, annotate. Folks, you've got to work out an annotation thing for yourself. You know, circling, underlining, highlighting, stars, slashes, arrows, whatever works for you, do that. Abbreviations, use them. But here's the thing, make certain that those abbreviations, those symbols are understandable to you. They don't have to be understandable to anybody else, just to you. Right? Beware of the organizational and rhetorical elements. Be aware of thematic lines and details. Now, you'll notice I had this last one highlighted, and this is a, it, it can be problematic for some folks. I personally read the question stems before reading the actual text in which those stems are based. That works for me. If you have to try it out, 
because for me, I look at those stems and I have an idea how the creators of the test happen to be thinking about the reading. That works for me. It may not work for you, but give it a try. See if it is. Okay, next. For the reading comprehension texts, annotate as you read, locate the thesis and underline it, underline it. Read the passage with rhetorical analysis in mind. Now, some of you are familiar with soapstone. Some of you use um, a CAT scan or whatever it is. Uh, subject, occasion, audience, purpose, speaker, and tone. That's soapstone. This will give you a fairly decent outline as to the rhetorical situation. Pay close attention to transitions and underline those transitions or put an arrow or a star, however you want to notate. Then when you go to the questions, okay, you're gonna find that you have five choices. Now here's the thing, all those choices are really related to the reading, but only one is correctly going to respond to the question. So read the five, don't skip, read all five choices. Don't say, I got it, I got it, no, no. Read all five choices. And once you've done that, usually you're gonna, most of the time you will come up with a, either one or two that you know are right. You will also come up with one or two that you know are wrong. If they're wrong, just immediately put a cross through them or whatever you wanna do, but indicate the ones that you think are right with a circle or whatever, and the ones that you think are wrong with a slash or an X, however it is, but eliminate all the wrong answers, okay, immediately. Then you usually, some folks say, I usually end up, you know, Murph, I usually end up with two that look good. Keep a couple of things in mind that when you have a multiple choice question, all of the material within the choice has to be correct. Anything that's incorrect in the choice makes the entire choice incorrect. So keep that in mind. But if you have an answer that stares you straight in the eye and says, this is it, this is it, this is correct, it's probably correct for you, okay? Usually, always exceptions, but usually. And the last thing I want you to be aware of is the timing and the pacing. How fast do you read? Okay. How carefully do you read? Remember, you have 45 questions to do in 60 minutes. So you, the only way you're gonna know that is to test yourself. Do those practice tests, see how well you do. Where are your trouble spots? Okay, next. And for the writing texts, you'll be given a writing and they'll, they're gonna be shorter for the most part. The reading comprehension texts are going to be longer, okay? The writing ones are gonna be shorter for the most part. So the first thing that look at is there are delete questions, there are transition questions, there are um, combination of sentences questions, but first of all, identify the topic of the passage, ask yourself, is whatever I'm choosing relevant, logical, is the sentence acting in support of what the question is asking me to do? Is it clarifying information? And then ask yourself, why did I choose this one? Why am I choosing this? And if you look at your choices, okay, choose the answer that comes closest to your answer, why? Why? That is usually going to be the one that works. There's always going to be an exception, but that's usually going to be the one that works for you. Next. The tip. Now, in general, these are just general, general, general situations for yourself. If a question refers to a specific line or paragraph, read what comes directly before and immediately after that line or paragraph. Don't, don't skip that, okay? Don't skip it. Don't second guess yourself. I find over and over and over again, Folks are second guessing themselves. Well, I thought that usually your first take, if it's immediate, is the right take. Okay? Don't try to play games with, the, with the, a point. There is not a single question on the multiple choice 
section of the exam that's trying to trick you. There are no gotchas, okay? There are distractors, but there are no gotchas. They're not trying to trick you into choosing something. So don't try to play that game. A lot of kids fall into that situation. Oh, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, test the test. No, 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 no. Okay. They're not trying to do that to you. They're trying to get an honest response from you. So don't try to play that game. If part of the answer is incorrect, the entire answer is incorrect. Okay. You can't get half a crest. Okay. And there, here's a good thing for a lot of you. There is no vocabulary testing on the exam, right? They're not gonna give you uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and ask you for what it means, okay? Or a synonym for it. That's not gonna happen. The vocabulary of the course concerns itself with rhetorical analysis, with argument, with rhetorical choices, with rhetorical techniques. And this is the kind of vocabulary that they're going to assume you are familiar with. Anything else you're going to have to get from the context. And so give yourself the opportunity as the year progresses to become very, very familiar with the language of the course. It's like being in bio. You need the language of bio in order to take the exam. You need the language of English language in order to take the exam. That's important. The other thing is, if you have any doubt, go to the glossary at the end of the five steps book. It'll give you an idea of what all of those terms are. Okay, next. Ah, here we come. Let's so just start. to let you know, Barbara, we're, believe it or not, we're cruising up on about a half hour. We're at 426, so we're about a third of the way through, yep. just to keep that in mind as we get the uh, this part started. Okay, so we're going to go uh, to the some samples. This is the first. Um, I'm going to move this aside here. To this can I interrupt you, Barbara, quickly? If for those yep. that are participating, you can just easily click and drag the polls feature over to the right. So it won't, you can still, and that should stay in the same position for the subsequent polls as well. Go ahead. Okay, here is your first one. Uh, this is, again, I'm just gonna read the first opening. Carefully read the following passage from John Steinbeck's Canary Road and answer the question that follows. This is a, a modern context. It should be easy enough to read. So I'm gonna ask you to take one minute to read the, the text and to answer the single question that follows. Make your choice and put it on the uh, poll sheet. All right, let's take a look at the answer, shall we? All right, most people got it. Ah, oh, I like to see that. I like to see that. Now notice what I have written here. The major rhetorical strategy used in this passage to define Cannery Row is comparison contrast. For example, line one presents Cannery Row as a poem and a stink. It is a grating noise and a quality of life. The definition goes from negative to positive throughout the passage. There are no directions for the construction of an item, A. The definition of Cannery Row makes a claim, but there is no support, B. The author does not present cause and effect, as in C. And in this passage, nor does he relate a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. Good going, good going. Let's take a look at the next practice. Here we go. This is um, 
There are two questions which go with this. And um, the, it's an excerpt from The Week Shall Inherit the Gym by Rick Riley. So if you would please go to the first reading and then uh, I'll give you uh, one minute for that, then we'll go to the second. Good. All right, let's see. Let's take a look, see at the answer. And your answer is B, looking good, looking good. The tone of the passage can best be described as critical and sarcastic. Remember that when each choice contains more than one item, each of the items must be correctly found in the text. With this in mind, Harsh, ironic, or humorous could be part of the conversation, but the words that they are paired with negate their validity. Hmm. It's important to remember that, okay? So let's take a look at the next. Again, same text, different question. Let's only give this 30 seconds, shall we? Yes. Okay. Oh, hey, we have a really good uh -oh. uh, conglomeration of answers here. Let's, see what uh, we got. let's take a look at the answer. D, okay. The only rhetorical technique, I think with the problem could be the idea of what a parody is. The only rhetorical technique not used in this passage, it's parody. The use of everybody is an example of hyperbole, A, cozy womb of non-competition and little red riding hood and big bad wolf are metaphors, B. The entire ex excerpt is ripe with biting criticism, as in C. The idea of little red riding hood setting up a commune with the big bad wolf is a nod to satire. And parody, a humorous, exaggerated imitation of a given action, person, or item is not used in this text. Now, here's a clue for everyone. If you did not know what parody is, take a look. It's defined here for you, but also go to the glossary in the text of five steps and it'll be defined again for you. And I can guarantee you that this term and the others used in this uh, multiple choice question will be used many times in the exam. So get those uh, those terms straight for yourselves, okay? So Barbara, I uh, I don't know if I missed it before, but Audrey Geber, uh, about three, four minutes ago, uh, asked a question in the Q&A, in regard to rhetorical modes, mm -hmm. could this be considered a definition passage? I think it was the one that we were on a couple. Yeah, that could that could be, that could be. That could be termed a def as a type of question that it is, sure, sure. Okay, Audrey, if you need us to clarify toward the end, please come back and ask. ask sure, Audrey. sure. Let's cruise again. All right. So here we have this. And now you can guarantee yourselves again that within the uh, multiple choice section will be um, texts from a different time period. Here's an example of one from Common Sense by Thomas Paine. So give this a read. One minute, please.
right, I'll divided I'll, once I'll again. A variety of choices here too. Let's take a look. Um, but, but before oh, I we- think I, I, did I go, did I skip one? Let's see. This is the question, yes? Yeah. We may be missing a slide, my bad. Um, can you just tell us what the answer well, is, Barbara? Here's a good opportunity for us to take a look at it together. So here we have, oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose, not only the tyranny, but the tyrants stand forth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger, and England hath given her warning to depart. Oh, receive the fugitive and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. Okay, so let's take a look. We have an example of hyperbole all over the place, right? We have exhortation. We have, oh, receive the fugitive. Oh, ye that, ye that dare. This is exhortation. Uh, parallelism. Uh, do we see parallelism here? Let's take a look. Oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only, uh, oh, receive the fugitive. We have that kind of situation. And do we have metaphor? Yes, we do. Overrun with oppression, hunted around the globe. What we don't have, okay, is simile. Okay, my apologies for that. I think that's okay. Uh, oh, you know what? It was, I got it. I, ah, well, no, no, no. I, I went ahead. Sorry. My bad. Okay. So let's Here's take a look one. at the next one. All right. Sorry. I'm going to, um, I'm going to go back. I think, um, well, we, 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 can, we can do them all. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. All right. Let's just uh, I think go, this go was the response episode. we were looking for, but uh, let's go back and do this one. Sorry about that. Okay. This is, again, another one from Common Sense. Uh, again, we, the tone of the paragraph, okay, can best be described as, now take a look at your choices, assertive and irreverent, pandantic, pandemic and reserved, indignant and arrogant, apologetic and effusive, zealous and passionate, okay? Now, if we look at the first one, there's assertions being made, but it's not irreverent. Um, this is, uh, we could not pick B because it is truly uh, almost the opposite here. Indignant and arrogant, no arrogance is being uh, shown. Apologetic, uh, 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 even though it's effusive, and then we have zealous and passionate. Both of those adjectives work. Let's see, take a look. There you go. Okay, so that's the way you would work your way through, you know, the series of uh, of choices. Again, it's a very very good example. <laughs> it's a very very good example of. Um, both terms having to be correct in order for the choice to be correct. Next reading. Sorry, I see that Angela Hamrick is asking a question. Angela, I think you're 100% right. I'm going to get to this at the end. I don't want to hold it up yet, but thanks for that. And we're going to get back to that when we do the questions at the end. Okay. Ah, here we come. The writing situation. Now, this, again, uh, is going to ask you to take a look at the text and to look at it as if you were the writer and how you would make some changes. Here is asking you for a transition. Easy enough to read, very acceptable, accessible reading. Take a look, give it a close reading and make your choices. And in this particular case, I'm going to give you a minute and a half.
All right. It's like most answered C. What do we got here? We have is our answer. You got C. Although the question asks you to identify the best transition. In reality, you need to focus on the information contained in both paragraphs. The transition must logically flow from the preceding paragraph into the second. C connects the idea of home that is introduced in the first paragraph and is the basis for the second. A keeps a bump in the line of reasoning is too abrupt. B is not based on any information in the first paragraph. And D and E rely on details that are not presented in either paragraph. Okay, let's go to the next. Another transition. Let's take a look. This is a briefer textual reading. So let's give this a minute, shall we? Okay, and the answer is B. You got it. All right. Although the question is phrased in terms of a transition, you must focus on the information that follows because the underlined sentence must set up that information. What comes before is less important. The sentence that follows indicates that the writer decided to visit all the national parks in the United States as a result of his or her experience in Yosemite as indicated by the word therefore. As a result, the correct option must be positive and consistent with the idea of wanting to visit additional national parks. C, D and E are off topic, but be careful with A. The statement that the writer had never seen such dramatic scenery before might seem to explain the desire to visit more parks, but B is much more specific. The phrase couldn't wait to experience that kind of adventure again indicates a direct cause for the statement that follows. Okay. And here is another one. Again, it is shorter. So let's give it a one minute, shall we? Barbara, we're at 45 minutes, so we're halfway home. Just okay. a little time check for you. That's exactly what I hoped. Okay, let's take a look at what we have for answers. And the winner is, Bob will show us. There we go. There nice. you go. Delete questions are essentially asking you to do one thing, whether the information in question is on or off topic. As a result, you must start by identifying the topic of the passage. What's the topic? In this case, paper clothing. I love it. Suits. What is the sentence in question about? The first rubber erasers? Is that the same thing as paper clothing? No. 
So the sentence should be deleted. Why? Because it's off topic. Okay, it's not really about paper clothing. I, I think that whole thing is so funny. So the answer here uh, is B. This next is the most complicated kind of question that you probably will be asked on the writing section of the multiple choice uh, exam. So I'm gonna ask you to take, let's give it a minute and a half, read this carefully and be very careful with your choices, okay? All right. Ah, oh, you're courageous. Let's see what we have as our answer. D, the key here is that the writer wants to, and here, emphasize the fulfillment of her promise. Choice D places her promise alone in the forefront and provides a time frame for achieving the promise. Choice A gives no indication of any fulfillment. Choices B, C, and E are incorporated into paragraphs with information that is incidental to the promise she made. So you're, you're right on target there with choosing B. Now, folks, I, I, I want you to, to take a deep breath and make a little note to yourself, just going through those samples that we just saw, which of the two types are you more comfortable with? Do you find that you know, it comes easier to you. If it's the reading, perhaps you would like to do the reading multiple choice questions before you do the writing. If it's just the opposite and you find that the writing questions can go much more quickly for you, then you may want to do that first. It's a decision you can make because in the exam, you don't have, when it's in person, you do not have to go in order. You can go back and forth, make some you know, decisions on your own, but you should be very aware what works best for you in timing? Is it go in order, do all the reading first and then the writing questions, switch it around. However it works for you, that's what you want to do. But you can only determine that if you give yourself some practice and you give yourself something on which to base that decision. Okay, so let's go to the second part of the exam. You've had a wonderful break. Okay, talk to your friends, commiserate it back in your seats and the timer says to you it is time to go to the frequent for the free response questions as we said earlier 55 percent of your final score two hours and 15 minutes you have three prompts rhetorical analysis argument synthesis and in the order that they are given on the exam synthesis comes first rhetorical analysis comes second and an argument comes last you do not have to do them in that order, okay? During the 15 extra minutes that you're given, okay, the assumption is you're going to spend those 15 minutes doing two things. One, looking and reading every prompt of the three, okay? Read prompt one, prompt two, prompt three. And then spend the rest of your time reading the sources given to you for the synthesis essay. 
and you're going to annotate, you're going to, you know, do a quick skim of them to decide, okay, yes, yes, yes. I will speak to those in a, in a minute. Um, and each of those essays will be scored one point for a thesis statement, four points maximum for evidence and commentary, and one point for sophistication. This is across the board, okay? And that you can, if you, if this is worth 55 points of your exam, okay? And it is, each of those three is worth three points. Okay? You can begin to do some kind of calculation. Please don't with me because I get hives with math, all right? So let's go to the next one for, for yourself. The reading passages can be from different time periods and subject areas. So you will have, as you know, throughout your year, different subject matters, different time periods. Uh, readings are usually between four to 700 words. I have, I've rarely seen uh, readings that are in that, you know, the high 700 range. Most of them are around five, five, 600 words. The prompt will ask for an analysis of the rhetorical choices the writer makes in addressing the rhetorical situation. This is for the rhetorical analysis essay across the board. Now with the rubric, here's a thesis for one point, a clear and defensible thesis related to the prompt. Folks, tattoo it on your foreheads, read the prompt, all right? Don't assume anything, read the prompt and write your thesis so that it directly addresses what's asked you asked of you in the prompt. The evidence and commentary, you're gonna to go to your text, you're gonna find things that support your thesis, and you're gonna comment on those pieces of evidence and how they relate to your thesis. So it presents evidence to support the line of reasoning. Now remember what the line of reasoning is, that's the organization, okay? That's the organization of your presentation. Explains how the evidence supports the line of reasoning. One of the things that I, I like to think about when uh, writing one of these essays is the writer says and does because. Says, does, because. If you can keep that in mind when you're writing your body paragraphs, right on target. And the sophistication point, which usually causes everybody to get hives, is only worth one point out of six. Okay, please keep that in mind. Out of 18 points for your essay questions, for your essays, only three of those points are made up of sophistication. So I want you to stop sweating about this. We'll talk about it in a minute. It uses appropriate grammar and punctuation in communi communicating the argument, and it demonstrates thorough knowledge of the rhetorical situation. Um, and, and at the end of this section, I will give you much, much more detail about sophistication, okay? Let's go to the next slide. For the argument essay, same kind of thing is in, you know, is, is in your rubric, but you're going to develop the understanding of the nature of the position presented in the prompt. You're going to develop a position in response to the prompt, and you go out clearly and logically support your position, claim, or thesis. And the rubric, again, it's the same situation that we just talked about with the rhetorical analysis. All those things are in effect. But here in the argument for you, you have the opportunity to use your personal experiences, what you've read, what you've seen, what you've heard, current events, cultural, philosophical, sports, it doesn't really matter for me, it matters for you. Does it support what you have stated in your thesis? So that's the argument essay. Now we get to the synthesis essay, which is really an argument, right? So what you're gonna do, Bob, we'll get to the next slide here, is you're gonna take a look at the prompt and you're going to see that basically you're given a context and then you are given a instruction. It says, read the text critically and analytically for their position, argument, and the bias given the subject matter. Develop a position on a given topic with support from appropriate evidence from the outside sources. And you're going to incorporate and cite sources in the text of the essay. For our purposes, it is going to be at least three. You must cite three of the sources, okay? If you do not cite three of the sources, you're up the creek without the paddle, right? And again, the, 
uh, thesis is going to address the prompt with a thesis that clearly takes a position and indicates how the thesis will be developed. It clearly presents for the evidence and commentary a support of the thesis by referring to at least three of the given sources. And it clearly explains the relationships, this is key, the relationships between the evidence and the thesis. And for the sophistication point, exactly what we said previously. Okay, so let's get to a specific example. How much time do we have left, Bob? Uh, it's about it's coming up on the hour. So we've got about a half hour left. Okay, got about 20, 20, 25 minutes? Good. Okay, let's work with a sample text. For everything from this point on, we are going to be using a specific text to refer to. And before I even get to that text, it's just a few little notes about keeping annotations going in your mind's eye, all right? You must, you must, you must, you must, okay? Promise yourself that you will annotate the text as you go through them, as you read them, okay? Use arrows, underlines, as you see, stars, stripes, I don't care, whatever. Whatever will give you information about the organizational pattern and how it supports a thesis, you wanna do that, all right? And at the very end, after you've done all that, you've read the stuff, you annotated, promise, 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 you will do a brief outline. I don't care whether it's a single line, it's a series of circles, it's arrows, and whatever will give you, whatever will give you an idea in clear form as to what you're going to present and in what order will help. Without it, you're kind of flying blind, okay? Note to yourself, I will do a brief outline. I can't make it any stronger. Next. Okay, we are going to take a look at a text and we'll take a look at how it can be used in all the different essay situations. So read with me, this is, okay? I am going to read it at the same pace that I would read it if I were reading it to myself, okay? So when you are looking at your uh, essay prompts and the text that go with them, Read as if you're reading them out loud to an audience. It'll slow you down a little bit, but also give you a chance to have that pen or pencil in your hand so you can make annotations, okay? So here we go. The following is a speech given by Martin Luther King Jr. to a gathering of faculty and students at Morehouse College in 1947. Note, in 1947, Morehouse was an all-male African-American college. Information, very important. Purpose of education. As I engage in the so-called bull sessions around and about the school, I too often find that most college men have a misconception of the purpose of education. Most of the brethren think that education should equip them with the proper instruments of exploitation so that they can forever trample over the masses. Still others think that education should furnish them with noble ends rather than means to an end. It seems to me that education has a twofold function to perform in the life of man and in society. The one is utility and the other is culture. <clears throat> education must enable a man to become more efficient, to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of his life. Education must also train one for quick, resolute and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths, prejudices, and propaganda. At this point, I often wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit, in many instances, do not give us objective and unbiased truths. Next slide. To save man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. The function of education, therefore, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. But education, which stops with efficiency, may prove the greatest menace to society. The most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason, but with no morals. The late Eugene Talmadge, in my opinion, possessed one of the better minds of Georgia or even America. Moreover, he wore the Phi Beta Kappa key 
By all measuring rods, Mr. Talmadge could think critically and intensively, yet he contends that I am an inferior being. Are those the types of men we call educated? We must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. The broad education will therefore transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge of the race, but also the accumulated experience of social living. If we are not careful, our colleges will produce a group of closed-minded, unscientific, illogical propagandists consumed with immoral acts. Be careful, brethren. Be careful, teachers. Now, I read that out loud, and it took me three minutes and 16 seconds. Probably because I was doing this particular emphasis, it would have taken me less time if I had read it to myself. This next page shows you what my actual page looked like. These are my annotations. And this is this I did as I was reading the first time around. Okay. This is what your texts should look like. Scribble, lines, whatever. And you'll notice at the very, very bottom in very, very brief uh, phrases, et cetera, is my brief outline. So this is what one of those should look like. Okay. Next. Here is what an argument prompt based upon that essay could look like. In his essay, The Purpose of Education, written for his college newspaper, The Maroon Tiger in 1947, Martin Luther King Jr. states, and they would give you a section from the uh, text, and then here is your assignment. Write an essay that argues your position on Dr. King's ideas about the purpose of education, okay? And that is what the argument prompt would look like. And this is what would be expected of you. Take a quick look. Again, these are just things that you have seen previously, but respond to the prompt of the thesis that may establish the line of reasoning. Select and use evidence to develop and support your line of reasoning. Explain the relationship between the evidence and your thesis. Demonstrate an understanding of the rhetorical situation and use appropriate grammar and punctuation in communicating your argument. This is exactly what is said to you every single time you see an argument prompt. These, these are the staple wordings from the college board. Okay. Next, this is a th uh, the synthesis prompt. They will give you the rhetorical context, the rhetorical situation, and then they will say, okay, carefully read the given sources, including the introductory information for each source create a well-written essay that synthesizes material from at least three of the sources and develops your position on the purpose of education. And included in those sources could be Martin Luther King Jr.'s purpose of education. Okay. And on the next slide, again, what you'll see is exactly what the college board writes underneath the prompt. These are the expectations and it never changes for the synthesis. At this particular point, this is what you will always, always, always see, okay? And notice at least three of the provided sources. And the next, in the, in it, we are going to concentrate on is the rhetorical analysis, okay? So let's take a look, here's the prompt. Carefully read the purpose of education written in 1947 by Martin Luther King Jr to his student newspaper, for his student newspaper, Morehouse College's The Maroon Tiger. Then in a well-written essay, analyze the rhetorical choices King makes to convey his message about the purpose of education. Notice two things. You are being asked to do two things. You are being asked to analyze the rhetorical choices, okay? But you are also asked to tell the reader what the purpose of education is according to Martin Luther King. That's important. You have to have both. So it's a two-pronged essay that you're being asked to compose. So here, and what I would do, I would be underlining, I would be putting things uh, in between quotation marks or brackets or parentheses, whatever, so that I would highlight the important parts of that prompt, things I needed to know, okay? I now know who the uh, author is, where it took place, and the basic uh, 
analysis uh, question. So here is uh, the next slide. Make certain when you write your thesis, okay, that you have the article with a prompt in mind, okay? Keep the prompt in mind. Construct a thesis that addresses the requirements of the prompt, okay? Now, for this, two requirements. Message about the purpose of education and the rhetorical choices Martin Luther King makes to support his message, okay? So to get one point, you have to have at least, or a group of sentences, a single or a group of sentences, anywhere in the essay. For most of us, it's really the first paragraph, in a, especially in a text situation. Uh, clearly identifies the title of the text and or the author's name, clearly makes a claim, and clearly indicates the rhetorical choices to be analyzed, all right? Now, you don't have to be exclusively specific with that, but indicate the rhetorical choice. Now, what I'd like you to do is take five minutes, okay? Give yourself a chance to write, okay, the first draft of your own thesis that responds to this rhetorical analysis prompt. And Bob, can we go back to the prompt? One more back. That's there it. we go. I'm going to leave yep. that on there for five minutes. Give yourself a chance to write a thesis statement based on this prompt. Okay, go for it. Bob, I'm going to stop everybody. <clears throat> um, I, I think there probably a good number of people would have already completed this after three minutes. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna move on so that I can talk about what the possibilities are, okay? So can we go to uh, skip two slides? Ahead? We can, you know what, I apologize, Barbara. I'm just seeing now in the text, uh, someone was asking, is there any way we can be able to view the source again while we write the prompt? Oh, you know what? I missed that opportunity. So 
That was a good point. Well, you know what? I should have rem- I should have thought once we yeah, gave them the prompt to, to go back. back. Go back you know what? Check. My apologies to Evan and to and to the group. That would have been that's better. okay. That's, that's so maybe good. you know what? Yeah. If maybe we can come back to it um, if we have a if couple we, minutes we at time, the end. Sure. Okay, let's take a look at one I I put together. And uh, well, here we have three choices. Let's just try to work with it. We have um, take a look at the three, and based upon your own remembrance of the reading which of those three would be the best of the three to choose as your thesis statement Okay, let's move uh, to the next slide, Bob. The thesis that would get the one point is the one that reads in his essay, The Purpose of Education, published in his college newspaper, Martin Luther King Jr. argues that the true education must address both utilitarian needs and cultural goals. Speaking to his fellow students at Morehouse College in 1947, Dr. King cites both contrasts and current examples to warn against focusing only what he calls intelligence while ignoring character. And uh, I've highlighted the the author's name in yellow, uh, the the, the message uh, in blue and in pink, the rhetorical choices. And the other two don't have both of those uh, components in the the statement. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. And uh, again, you can't do this because uh, we didn't think, I didn't think far enough ahead to combine the two and one in front of the other. My apologies. So uh, I wanna say a few words about line of reasoning. We throw this uh, phrase around like crazy, okay? Line of reasoning, it simply means the logic of the presentation, okay? What comes first, what comes second, what comes third, uh, how they relate to the thesis and your personal comments on those particular points. So what I've done is to uh, give you a kind of schematic as to what this means. So you have the commentary, which specifically relates to the given pieces of evidence in a given paragraph. And the paragraph is centered around a specific uh, topic sentence, which relates specifically to the thesis. It's just a, some people work better with schematics and I just thought that may be useful to you. Okay, and uh, it's it's a logical sequence of claims. And one of the easiest things for you to do is to, as you go through your year and as you go through prepping for the exam, make certain you, uh, in your writing, you point out those transitions. They become very, very, very important in in, in in the essay presentation, okay? Next. This is, that's the thesis, and here is an example of a body paragraph. And when you get a chance, okay, we can, you can, uh, I have the sentences numbered for you in the body paragraph, and uh, you can go back and locate them uh, as I speak about them uh, on, when you have your own time to look at the presentation. So if I can have the next slide, this is my body paragraph. Now notice what I have. Yellow is topic sentence. Evidence is in blue and the pink purplish color is the commentary. Focusing on his belief that education must teach more than just math and science. King cites the examples of the experience of half truths, prejudice and propaganda to argue that education may not be doing the best job possible because he sees these weaknesses as current problems. These are not, now notice, then you get the personal a comment. These are not just abstract ideas that have no basis in the real world. MLK pushes the students to consider this accusation by citing even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit for being duplicitous in continuing to ignore the true differences between what is true and what is false, between what is function and what is moral and ethical. This message is made abundantly clear 
with his example of the late Georgia Senator Eugene Talmadge, whom King acknowledges to be an intellectual giant, but who contend, contended that black people are an inferior race. For MLK, there is no possibility of a just society without a solid knowledge of the moral ethical culture that supports a just society. So you can see, I'm hopeful that you can see the clear difference between the topic sentence, how that evidence relates specifically to that topic sentence and how the writer comments on those pieces of evidence. And that is what we mean by evidence and commentary. Okay, so can we go to the next slide? This is just again, when you uh, have time on your own, I give you the sentence numbers that you can go back to uh, and check uh, the specifics from the actual uh, text itself. And here we have a little star. I have my own little annotation note here. Um, sophistication goes for one point. And it's examples of what could be added that would be part of demonstrating sophistication or thought or a complex understanding of the rhetorical situation. So if I wanted to get involved in a, a sophisticated situation, a complexity and a consideration of the complexity, the writer could have written in the middle of the Jim Crow era in the South, there are not just abstract, these are not just abstract ideas that have no basis in the real world. Or, and then the beginning of another sentence, Senator Talmadge, what I've done as a writer is I've connected the specific text to something larger than itself. And the key here is it's connected to something larger than itself. And one of the, 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 the whole thing that goes with um, sophistication is people are so worried about it. I have to tell you, the sophistication point is not that rare. I mean, it, it's not every day, but it's not that rare. Remember, it's only three points out of 18. And in the last exam, more than a little bit more than 50% of the students got the point in sophistication. So that doesn't make it rare, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in rhetorical analysis and in um, uh, synthesis, you know, kids got about 50% of them got ones for the sophistication. It was a little bit lower with the argument uh, situation. But again, it's not an impossible situation. It's not impossible. But you can't, you can't just do it once in your essay and say, oh, I'm going to get sophisticated. It has to be throughout the essay. It has to be consistently presented so that you make your reader aware of your knowledge of the outside world and how these things connect to it. And that's important. Uh, a question that somebody uh, always asks is, well, if I have bad grammar, will I, uh, will I lose points? Probably because you have to make it clear and the clarity depends upon decent uh, syntax. And so we, we have to work with, but that sophistication is really uh, consistently aware of a world outside of the specific text. And in the next, okay, is for you, Bob. Yep. So uh, I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes here. If you wanna quickly fire up your phones and take a picture of this URL and the code. You don't want to take a picture of my puppy? I always got waiting for you to introduce him. What's his name? Bogey. As in Humphrey. Okay. It's a good picture. And he goes, he's dressed like in the McGraw-Hill color scheme too, which is a, a plus. That, that's the reason I chose it. <laughs> all right. I'm going to assume you've all uh, taken a picture. I'm going to just... Be patient with me as I stop sharing. I've got to get over to the other platform. Hold on. Okay. So I won't bring you through the, uh, the login page. If you go to that URL, MA, you know, MH mheducation.com slash AP Lang, whatever that is, 
and enter your code. It's a real simple, less than 30 second process to get you in and get you studying. Uh, here's what you'll find. So everybody, and I'm, I'm, before I just run through this quickly, I wanna emphasize, I'm not gonna be able to um, sort of go through everything that we have to offer. I would strongly urge everybody on the call to go in when you have some time and look at all the materials we have in here because there's a lot of robust review material that's gonna help you out between now and test day. Uh, so the dashboard scene, the dashboard page is the first thing you'll see. As, um, as Barbara mentioned earlier, there are 41 days uh, between now and the test. So it'll ask you for your test date, you'll put that in, and then it'll, it'll help you build a study plan between now. So then tomorrow when you go in, it'll first thing you'll see is this 40 days till test date. Uh, it's, that's going to be a big thing to help you um, as you create your study plan. I haven't been through this today, so you won't see any stats here, but as you go through, it'll help you gauge your strengths and weaknesses, show you where you are in percentile rack, your, your rank, your average score on practice tests when you take them, and the practice sections and the average score on the practice tests. Uh, and real quickly, I'll show you, there's a study plan, which is basically everything that's in our book. Um, that you can go through. If you want to look about, uh, talk about comprehensive review analysis. You can go through, and as you go through, you you when you read the sections, you can grade yourself high, medium, or low as you go through. Okay, some basics on analysis, the different types, discourse. I know all this stuff. I'm going to rate myself high. Uh, rhetorical strategies. Maybe I know a little bit less. I'm going to rank myself low. Um, so it's self-guided and it's really good. Uh, it's a good way to, to go through. The next time you log in, you'll come back to the lessons and you'll see here's where you went through. All the ones you self-guided, self-graded yourself as high. There's no reason to go back. And it's an easy way to see, you know what, rhetorical strategies, I rank myself low at something I needed to come back with. And that's how it's easy to flag. There's a game center. There's a couple of, you wanna uh, use gamification. There's a uh, quick, really basic games in here. Um, nothing too crazy. This is just uh, finding one front of a flashcard uh, and choosing the one that fits. So pedantic, let's see, which would that be? Not this one, writing that borders on lecturing. I think that's probably it, yeah? All right, look at that. I normally don't get them right. And then you go through. So just you can play games in here. There's an area for discussion with people will post things in here back and forth. Hey, did you think that the answer to number two was was weird and uh, all that type of stuff? And again, this is the lessons that this is where we were before. And this this is broken down exactly the way the book is broken down. So everything that you you would see in the review book is in here and you can hit this stuff whatever uh, in whatever order you like. There's flashcards. If nothing else, I would ur urge you guys to go in and check the flashcards because you can do them um, all at once. You can do a filter where you can do it by category um, and run through and it's just one click. Again, it's self-guided, so abstract. Definition on the back refers to language that describes concepts rather than concrete. Yes, of course, I know that. Did you get it right? No, kinda, or yes. It's the same sort of self-guided stuff. Ad hominem. Yep. Alliteration. That one we knew, right? And again, it'll the ones that you got, you, you uh, say you got it right, it won't come back. It won't present them until the very end when you come back next time. The ones that you gauge as either no or kind of, they will show up the next time you come in. One important thing about this platform is if you go into it on your PC or your MacBook at home and you start it, you get up to the flashcard on analogy. If you download the app, which is really simple and you leave home and you get on the bus and you want to do a little more studying on the bus, It'll when you go into flashcards, it'll lead, it'll take you in exactly where you left off. And the same goes for the review. 
if you're reviewing on uh, question number 19 and you go get on the bus and punch up the app, it's going to start you off at number 19. So it's a really it's a really pretty amazing way to review. Uh, there's a lot of practice questions in here. You want to talk about the argument. You can choose to, it's a lot of reading, obviously, in this Lang course. You can choose to keep the review answer on or off. You want to do them all and test yourself, turn it off. You want to review the questions as you go through. I'm going to take a guess here that it's C. And I got it right. I am on a, this is the best I've done. And then it'll give you an explanation at the end of why it's C. I'm done practicing, I'll come back. That's, so that's all the practice topics we have. And the most, possibly the most important thing that you could be spending your time on now is there are three full length tests that you can do in here, interactive. You do them all, it gives you the exact uh, amount of time that you need to take the test, the same, same time you'll find on test date. You've got section one is 45 questions, it's an hour. And section two, all the prompts we just went over, those three questions are an additional two hours and 15. And this is gonna mimic the real thing. So if nothing else, this is a really good tool for you, the teachers that are on the line to share with their students, the students that are on the line to use um, between now and the test date. Bob, can I, can I make, uh, give Please. one proviso to our folks? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a question that always is asked of me. Um, the readers look at every single essay as a first draft. That's important for you to remember. As a reader, I am looking at a first draft and I assume that's what it is. And therefore I'm looking at it holistically as an entity, okay, as a first draft. I do not want to punish anybody when I read. I want to award as much as I possibly can. I am looking for what's good there. I am looking for things to reward. I am looking for things to give credit to. I am not looking to take away. And that is for every single reader. You never have to doubt that, trust me. You never have to doubt that. Every single reader there is on your side. They are rooting for you from the very first word to the very last word, from the very first paper they read to the very last paper they read. They want you to succeed, believe me. Great tip, thank you, Barbara. So you'll see just the last word on here. I answered one question, got it right. Next time I come back, it's showing you my average score on practice questions is 100. So that's making me feel good, <laughs> feel good about myself. Um, you know, again, feel free to use this thing between now and test date. It's here for you. You've got the code. Um, I don't know. We've, we're back to like the last minute, Barbara. I don't know if there's anything else in the Q&A. I don't know if we want to revisit. There was something well, from earlier. Well, the thing that I will, will say is that if anybody has a question that obviously we didn't have time to answer, uh, they can always contact me at the clearest ideas uh, email address and I will get back to them as soon as I can. So Angela Hamrick, uh, if you're still on the line with us, you were right. That was my mistake on the on the slide. You were saying in that one particular reading that it did have a metaphor for hunted. Um, you were right. If you want to go back and, and uh, we don't have time now to do it, but I I appreciate your feedback and you were correct on that one. The answer was actually B and not C. So um, my apologies. Any closing remarks, anything else you wanted to mention, Barbara, before we uh, adjourn today? Now, again, um, I, I, your kids are going to do well. If, just allow them to feel confident, give them as many opportunities as possible to succeed. And uh, as students, you've got this. Just give yourself the time to prepare and do a little bit of practice. Great. So uh, we're at 531. We're a little bit over. I want to say thank you to all the teachers and the students that, that participated today, and especially to Barbara Murphy. Barbara did a terrific job. Really, really helpful stuff. Great material. 
And uh, I'm sure that it was that the uh, people on the webinar really appreciated. So uh, thanks very much for doing this, Barbara. Okay, call, I mean, get a hold of me at uh, Clearest ID if you have a question, guys. All right. Well, good luck, everybody. Thanks for attending, and we'll see you next time.